Welcome and thank you for joining us today for this event on leveraging just transitions across mitigation, adaptation and trade policies. My name is Adriana Chavarria. I am Program and Impact Manager at Climate Strategies and also acting head of our program team. And on behalf of Climate Strategies, I want to thank our co-hosts today, the Independent Republic of Papua New Guinea, the Stockholm Environment Institute and Plataforma CIPO. It's a very timely and relevant event as we approach the half point of this SB60. So we thank you all for joining us. For those who don't know Climate Strategies, we are a not-for-profit international brokerage organization. And we work with a network of over 100 researchers who are leading climate research and we help connect them to policy making to catalyze climate action. We have been working on advancing research on just transitions for over 100 years, we started in the coal sector, but soon after moved into broader aspects of the just transition and taking particular consideration of advancing the research in the global south as well. And this event actually sits in between two of our main projects, even though it brings into the conversation different pieces of our research. But those two projects are our South to South Just Transitions project and our project on making the climate trade, uh, excuse me, the trade system work for climate in which we are actually looking at border adjustments mechanisms or carbon border adjust adjustment mechanisms and some of the supporting mechanisms that can also leverage the BCAs. So for example, the G7 Climate Club, the GASA, or Global Arrangement on Sustainable Steel and Aluminium, and the OECD's Inclusive Forum on Carbon Mitigation Approaches. At the UNFCCC, we have seen an increasing realization of the interconnected nature of international trade and climate change, while about a quarter of global CO2 emissions are currently embedded in the international trade system through the products and services. Trade policy can also play a role in supporting countries in their efforts to decarbonize and adapt to the impacts of climate change. In particular, since COP28, we have also seen a uh, growing concern from parties around the deployment of unilateral measures related to decarbonization policies and the potential unintended consequences that they have for other countries' development pathways and transition pathways. And here what we are talking about is, saying it bluntly, the equity considerations of those measures and how they can, for example, restrict or drastically increase the costs of trade flows for developing countries. In that line, the outcome of the GST highlighted the importance of pursuing an open international trade system to enable climate action. But then again, we see that there are discrepancies among parties on whether or not the UNFCCC is the suitable forum to discuss this topic, and if so, where should it sit within the UNFCCC architecture? We think that the JTWP could be a space to support coordination and collaboration to go about these challenges, uh, but then again, some of these discrepancies have already come up. If you read the first draft of the SB60 text, there was a paragraph, paragraph 14, that was looking into the international trade, and it was a, a matter of really deep contestation, so at the moment it's unclear whether or not it's going to remain in the text. But this is precisely what we want to explore here today. How can we utilize the UNFCCC to support a race to the top rather than a race to the bottom when it comes to international trade and climate uh, policy in action? So we will begin by hearing, by, uh, by hearing from three knowledgeable presenters on policy resilience and justice aspects of climate-centric trade policies, followed by, by a discussion with steam panelists representing international organizations, businesses, policymakers from both developed and developing countries. I kindly ask our speakers to please stick to your allotted times because we have a packed agenda and a very interesting conversation and we also want to have time at the end for Q&A. And so without further ado, I'm honored to give the word to Mrs. Panda, uh, Renzi Panda, Manager of International Affairs and Community Outreach with the National Energy Authority of Papua New Guinea to deliver the opening speech. Mrs. Panda is one of the most senior negotiators in the PNG delegation and currently coordinates response measures and just transitions on behalf of the Alliance of Small Island States. So thank you very much for joining us and I'll give you the mic now. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Adriana. Uh, good afternoon, excellencies, ladies, gentlemen, and colleagues. Uh, Papua New Guinea Est is uh, honored to deliver the remarks and our reflections on the topic of this side event. Uh, we believe it's a 
it's a timely occasion that we deep dive into this issue and now we, we address it. When we talk about leveraging the concept of just transition across adaptation, mitigation, and trade policies, we are mindful of the need to integrate principles of fairness, equity, and social justice into these various areas to ensure a sustainable and inclusive transition to a low carbon economy. And this all started in Paris when the Paris Agreement 2015 was adopted inclusive of the 19 global mandate under Article 4, where the concept of economy-wide emission reductions was agreed to under Article um, 4.4. Uh, 4. This means that regardless of how a country chooses to implement its economy-wide emission reduction actions, it has to take into account adaptation and trade issues and challenges. And this is where the following realities become inevitable. In terms of adaptation policies, a just transition approach would involve ensuring that vulnerable communities, workers in high carbon industries and marginalized groups are not disproportionately affected by the impacts of climate change. It would focus on providing support for those most affected creating new job opportunities in climate resilient sectors and incorporating local knowledge and community input in adaptation strategies. When we talk about mitigation, it comes to climate change mitigation efforts, a just transition framework would prioritize the phasing out of high carbon industries in a way that minimizes negative social and economic consequences. It would include retaining programs for workers in carbon intensive sectors, ensuring that new green jobs are created and providing support for communities dependent on fossil fuel industries. This approach should aim to ensure that transition to a low carbon economy is fair and inclusive. And when we talk about trade policies, just transition principles can also be applied to trade policies by ensuring that the international trade agreements promote environmentally sustainable practices, protect workers' rights, and support communities impacted by global trade dynamics. And this includes considerations such as labor standards, environmental regulations, and mechanisms to support in transition industries. By leveraging a just transition framework across adaptation, mitigation and trade policies, policies, policy makers can work towards a more sustainable, equitable and socially just transition to a low carbon future. And by stepping back from my opening remarks, I would like to make mention of the efforts by the Papua New Guinea government immediately after Paris when we launched our national trade policy 2017 to 2032. And within the trade policy, we have a very specific section that's, that speaks to sustain, uh, trade and sustainability. And within that chapter, we talk about the enforcement of um, sustainability aspects within the context of trade, including environmental goods, products, and services. Last year, in 2023, the National Parliament of Papua New Guinea passed its first ever National Trade Act. And within the National Trade Act, the international aspect of trade with regards to goods and services is restricted to the processes and the discussions under the WTO. So when we talk about the impact of trade on mitigation and adaptation, we also strongly link that to the economy-wide emission reduction initiatives of parties, including PNG because currently we also have an amendment to our National Climate Change Act that speaks to efforts to be undertaken by the government in terms of accelerating mitigation efforts and the implementation of our NDCs, even through the imposition of fees, charges, and levies on carbon-intensive products entering PNG, and we currently have a minimum list. So essentially, by way of conclusion, this is not something that the rest of the world is going to avoid.
we have an existing mandate that we placed um, in front of us nine years ago. It will depend on each country on how they assess and they align, how they will address trade implications across the, the mitigation and adaptation priorities, linking it back to the global um, agreement that was reached in Paris in terms of the consensus to move forward on how each country will determine its own economy-wide uh, emission reduction. And this also applies to a group of regions and regional bodies, including mm -hmm. configurations such as the European Union. So even for Papua New Guinea, the impact of the EU Green Deal has not come as a surprise. This was something we anticipated well after the conclusion of the Paris Agreement, that the only direction most countries around the world will take in terms of realistically reducing their emission reduction and transitioning away from high carbon intensive sector is also through trade measures. As we conclude the challenge now before us under this process and our colleagues under the WTO process is where do we find the common ground where we can understand each other and start the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Panda. Really good points that you're raising and also very important ones because they not only apply to Papua New Guinea or SEEDS, but also to other developing countries that are facing similar challenges. So very glad to have you here. Um, Mrs. Jacob, thank you for joining us. So I'm going to move on now to Mikael. Mikael Alan Michelson is policy fellow with the International Climate Risk and Adaptation Team at the Estocolm Environment Institute, who will introduce us to the topic of just transitions for sustainable and resilient supply chains. Mikael is also one of our research partners in a different uh, initiative or project that we have looking at just resilience in Global South countries. Welcome, Mikael. Thank you, Adriana, and thank you everyone here for joining us today. So, um, as she mentioned, um, I'm a policy fellow at Stockholm Environment Institute, where some of my recent work has been looking into examining how climate impacts are affecting businesses and reconfiguring supply chains and the effects that this has on the workers and the community that underpin them. At the same time, we're also conversely looking at how just transition principles can be leveraged to enhance the resilience and the sustainability in these supply chains. And it's indeed in the context of the latter that we did some interesting work with the UN Global Compact via their Think Lab, which is a public-private uh, coalition uh, led by the United Nations, brings together 27 businesses and other intergovernmental organizations, such as the International Labor Organization and the uh, Confederation of Interna the International Trade Union Confederation, which sets out to accelerate the positive impacts of businesses uh, environmentally and socially. And so we worked on producing a, a brief through research and business consultation that sets out to First of all, describe the effects of different types of climate risks on businesses and their supply chains, and highlight the benefits of improving the sustainability and resilience of supply chains through just uh, transition. In doing so, we would be drawing on ex existing business practices to demonstrate how multinational corporations are working with suppliers to manage climate and social risks in concert. We also make recommendations for businesses based on, on these insights to achieve just transition across climate mitigation and adaptation in their supply chains and explore the role of public policies uh, in facilitating just transition through business-led climate actions in their supply chains. So the crux of this work is exploring the interplay between three different types of risks and the social justice implications. So the first one being transition risks which relates to, of course, the both legislative and the policy drivers, as well as the market and technological drivers or, and the risk related that are hindering companies that fail to transition to a low carbon or net zero compatible business models, could lock them out of markets or make their market access more expensive or even erode the business models altogether with changing consumer preferences, as well as when uh, low carbon options become more cost effective. Now, the second, uh, when we, it's the physical climate impacts of climate change. So we're talking about both the, the acute impacts, heat waves and floodings, as well as the slow onset, rising temperatures and sea levels that are likely to disrupt supply chains. They're already doing that in, to certain, uh, on, on a significant scale, both uh, reducing uh, agricultural yields in some cases, um, floods and storms are causing disruptions by inflicting damage on infrastructure, 
transportation infrastructure and, and, and manufacturing hubs. Um, and, but there's also the third risk, which is what we refer to as maladaptation or adaptation action with adverse outcomes. So maladaptation refers to actions that are meant to increase resilience uh, by reducing vulnerabilities. But in reality, they actually increase the vulnerabilities either down, uh, down the line in terms of time or across space or by pushing those vulnerabilities onto other stakeholder groups. And uh, in, in drawing on these insights and examining the interplay between these, uh, we extrapolated uh, several key findings that we translated into um, recommendations for businesses and governments. And if we start with some of the, the, the key uh, points that we wanted to uh, highlight for the business side of things, uh, first of all, is to improve the transparency of supply chains. So businesses need to conduct materiality assessments and engage with suppliers to better understand their exposure to climate and social risks across their supply chains, as well as the negative externalities that the businesses have themselves on the environment and society. Now, what we saw from our consultation that many of these uh, think, uh, these uh, think lab companies were already uh, starting to move significantly on sustainability related risks, as well as uh, human rights and workers' rights. But the physical climate risk were quite a bit of a blind spot for them. Now, we also highlight the need to integrate risk management through just transition principles. So businesses that manage different climate risk and social impacts in their supply chains in an integrated manner will be better positioned to improve sustainability and resilience of their supply chain by unlocking co-benefits and ident identify trade-offs between adaptation, mitigation, and social actions. And a good example is that companies that integrate social justice in their mitigation they are found to have uh, easier access and better retention of workers with relevant skills, and it facilitates technological uptake as well. When it comes to integrating those very same social and, and equity concerns into adaptation, it actually it results in a more resilient supply chain through the workers in the communities that are less likely to see disruptions to their business operations when in, in face of extreme weather volatility. And then there's also the interface between sustainability and resilience, where studies are shown that supply chains that are sustainable are also more resilient. And then support capacity building and access to finance for small and medium-sized enterprises. So businesses need to work with social partners to support suppliers with weaker institutional and financial capacity in their efforts to implement mitigation and adaptation measures in a socially just manner. It's not enough just to layering clauses on adaptation and sustainability some of these suppliers don't have the institutional capacity and they really need uh, the businesses to work with them to uh, support their effort in addressing these social environmental risks. Now, when we come to the side of government, there was a strong call for all the companies that we spoke about for greater action on the government side, both in terms of legislative actions as well as increasing economic incentives. So in terms of the former, it was considered a need to have a strong um, mandatory requirements from governments and robust enforcement mechanisms to ensure that the to enable the kind of systems change required to deliver a socially just, sustainable, and resilient supply chains. They understood that they could there are certain th actions that they can do which are more kind of low hanging fruit solutions, but the uh, the more transformative actions are capital intensive, and therefore there are concerns that there actions as early movers could actually render them uh, uncompetitive in the marketplace. And this is why they really wanted to see businesses leveling the playing field. Also, government should design better public procurement systems to send a clear market signal about products, services, and infrastructures that are produced in an environmentally and socially responsible manner. So it was highlighted for multiple companies that if public, if public procurement services are only going to be considering cost effectiveness, then you'll find a race to the bottom. Thirdly, governments should work with businesses and social partners to provide technical support and access to finance that will enable SMEs to adopt environmentally and socially responsible business practices. So, business, so small and medium SMEs, as, we mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, are often the very suppliers, but they also rely on supply chains themselves, over which they have very limited influence because of weaker balance sheets and lower access to finance. And then finally, since workers with informal contracts have often limited labor rights and weaker social protection, governments should take steps to formalize employment conditions 
and in businesses and work together with social partners to set in place mandatory requirements that address decent to work deficits. This is another issue where it's difficult for companies to even move beyond the first tier suppliers, especially when you have a very decentralized workforce, which no one has accountability or, or, or responsibility for. So uh, those are just some of the insights that I wanted to uh, highlight from the report that we produced. Thank you very much, Michael. Really, really interesting presentation. And I know we gave you a big challenge to cover all of that in just eight minutes. So we really appreciate that. Um, I will now like to introduce our final presenter from this round, Mayara Foley, Executive Director and Co-Founder of Plataforma Cipo, a Brazil-based think tank that focuses on issues of climate, sustainable development and international relations. Mayara will discuss positive incentives and partnerships to build a sustainable and just international trade system. Thank you, Mayara. Thank you, Adriana. Uh, for the introduction, it's a pleasure for me to be here, but also for Plataforma Cipo to be a partner with uh, Global Realities and uh, the Stockholm Environment Institute and Papua New Guinea on this dialogue. Um, my remarks will be based on the work of Plataforma Cipo, but especially our experience as the lead co-lead of the T20 Task Force on Sustainable Climate Action and Just Transitions. Uh, the T20, for those who don't know, is a G20 engagement group of think tanks and research institutions. And because I only have eight minutes and I will stick to my time, I will focus on a single issue, which is a, a key concern that is very frequently brought to us both by governments, but also by think tanks in the global south when we think about the relations between climate, just transitions and trade, which is the issue that Michael mentioned as well in his presentation of the negative externalities for the developing world of the just transition, which is take, of the transition which is taking place in the global north. Um, there's been a lot of attention and conversation. We've been part of many in the past few years, especially at the couple uh, in the past couple of years about the EU Green New Deal, the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act, but I'd say not as much attention on the potential negative impact that those uh, initiatives and framework could have uh, in developing country, and especially, and most importantly, what are the measures and policies that can be put in place to fix uh, some of those asymmetries. Um, and to illustrate the point I'm making, uh, I'm going to bring uh, uh, some figures from UNCTAD, because um, UNCTAD estimates the CBAN, so the EU carbon bottom, carbon bottom, sorry, <coughs> adjustment mechanism um, could indeed lead to a reduction in carbon emissions, but of no more than 0.1%. At the same time, it could increase uh, the income of developed countries by 2.5 billion US dollars, but on the other hand, it could lead to a reduction of 5.9 billion US dollars in the income of developing nations. So the disparity in this case is quite significant. And when we think about UDR, so the EU deforestation regulations, um, there are some research, including by the Global Sovereign Advisory, that shows that among the countries who are most exposed to this regulation, when we consider the, the commodities which are covered um, and also the export uh, dimensions, all of those countries are developing countries, and specifically Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Uganda, Burundi, Ethiopia, Honduras, Guatemala, and Brazil. And it's, it's worth pointing out that some of those countries, uh, in addition to facing still high levels of poverty, hunger, and other um, inequalities, some of them also uh, face a serious debt crisis, which often prevent them from having the fiscal space to invest in climate action. And that's why it's our view at support that if we, are, if we are serious about delivering on a transition that is in fact global and benefits us all, we need to be talking more about positive incentives and partnerships. You know, there's no doubt that we need more sustainable supply chain. We know a lot of these trade flows are 
contaminated by deforestation, environmental crimes, and other forms of environmental uh, harms. But on the other hand, we need to take into account the social dimensions that come uh, when we think about uh, those uh, trade measures and regulations. And I know there's been some attempts by the EU and others to establish partnerships to, to address some of those concerns, but much more needs to be done, in my view, including because those three, those discussions, which used to be a bit more confined into the space of the WTO or the G20 and more, let's say, economic financial bodies, now these discussions are impeding improvements and developments in other forums as well, including the, you know, the UN Climate Convention. So here in Bonn, we've been following more closely the negotiations around the Just Transition Work Program. And from the meetings I've been and from the countries which uh, make intervention in developing countries in particular, in particular, all of them either speak on the national capacities or representing wider groups like the G27 in China or the Arab group, all of them have mentioned the issue of unilateral economic measures as being an impediment to sustainable development. And all of them have called for more equitable uh, solutions to this issue. And again, in my view, we can only advance and provide those equitable, equitable solutions that we always mention if we make more progress on the means of implementation, right? Being the form of capacity building, uh, finance or technology transfer and core development, depending, of course, on the reality of each country. Because when we think about supply chains, it is true that a lot of countries, including developing countries, they already have quite developed environmental monitoring or supply chain traceability system. And sometimes it's just a matter of supporting them to expand those systems to a national scale. Uh, other countries might benefit from capacity building to design well-structured plans uh, to clean up the supply chain from social environmental harms. Uh, but others might already have those plans and what they need is the finance to implement them. So my, the point I wanted to make, and I know my, my time is finishing and I'll finalize it, is that we need to, to take into account each country's circumstances, but we need to focus more when doing so on what are the positive incentives and the tools that we can provide to those countries so that they are not only able to have sustainable supply chains, but they can uh, promote the economy-wide uh, transition that Rainsley was talking about, which is aligned with the 1.5 target. And um, Brazil has been putting this topic of just transition and negative externalities and how to build institu institutional capacity and increase finance in the scope of the G20. So it is welcome that these discussions are having there. So I believe there is some momentum for us to think more pragmatically on how we can foster international cooperation, but most importantly, coordination to, to prevent and mitigate those negative externality and ensure that the transition is indeed global and fairer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayara, for also shining a light uh, on two different topics that are also really interesting, like not only the, frame, the framework of incentives and partnerships, but also bringing in this a notion of the fragmentation of the institutions that are dealing with the topic and how this is currently impeding also progress, uh, probably in, in most, if not all of them, on climate action and, cli and progress on climate targets. Um, so I will now like to move on into the next panel. Thank you all of you for this conversation starters. I will move on now to Jenny. So Jenny, we have heard a lot today about businesses and supply chains. So being the World Business Council for Sustainable Development at the heart of this conversation, can you please tell me why is it important to engage businesses and the private sector in just transitions across supply chains? I, and I may actually throw in the second questions at once, just in case you can refer to both. What challenges are businesses facing when doing this? But also what kind of opportunities they can realize if they actually tackle some of those overcoming barriers? Sorry, or some of those barriers. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and yes, WBCST is a, a long acronym. For those of you who don't know it, it was set up at the Rio Earth Summit and involves 250 multinational companies responsible for 
five trillion capex and um, and about forty percent of global emissions. And we also work with uh, partner organisations, business councils um, on the ground in sixty countries as well. So I think it's really interesting this conversation. I've been in about three conversations just in the past week that have all. Brought And uh, just transition, I was at a discussion yesterday at the OECD that was all about industrial green policies and, and this kind of topic of, of trade and supply chains and just transition came up a, um, a lot. Um, so for us, this is really, really critical. And I think the social dimension and just transition is, is really rising up the agenda um, of businesses. Uh, we set up a business commission for tackling inequality about a year and a half ago, which set out an action plan. Um, set out the challenge, but also an action plan for how to um, uh, address some of the areas of this topic. And this is continuing now with a action focus. So I think at the heart of this is that inequality is a systemic risk for businesses. Um, you know, a company's social license to operate um, is coming to depend on factors related to a just transition and how it factor is being factored into corporate planning. And it's increasingly being seen as um, an aspect for investors as to whether uh, as an indicator of the long-term profitability and sustainability of businesses. So just as an example, Vale, uh, one of our members, suffered a huge crisis in, in Brazil uh, in terms of mine dam tailings, which um, had a huge impact on uh, the environmental impacts on, on communities, but also, also rivers. They've had to entirely address how they think about just transition and how they build social responsibility into their corporate planning in order to have that social license to operate. And I think a lot of businesses are, um, are thinking about that too. Also, it's an aspect of attracting and retaining talent, which we heard about earlier. It's an as aspect around ensuring the value of investments. So the risk of this kind of social backlash against um, the transition is a huge is issue for businesses um, and also resilience of supply chain. So that's obviously some of the resilience in terms of access, but it's also around geopolitical risks um, and other aspects as well. As so businesses have a huge role to play, um, they are in communities, they're training people, um, they are making investments, um, and they are also working not just on their businesses, but throughout their supply chains as well. And I think all, everything that Michael addressed is the, what business needs to do are, are things that um, we're working on and thinking about. I mean, the big challenge I would say at the moment is that there's um, no widely acceptable set of principles for just transition transactions or a coherent definition and baseline of success for just transition. So it's very difficult to comp have compar compar comparability between businesses, uh, but also to access the financing um, that's needed. And I think, as, as Michael said, I think there's a lack of some of this assessment of risk and value chains. There's a lot of focus on uh, human rights, but less of that, um, uh, some of the um, information and data from suppliers in, in terms of uh, the risks. But I think there's a huge opportunity here. And I think, as we've heard this you know, the biggest risk I see in the transition is that we've had such a focus on the technical aspects and insufficient focus on the, on the social aspects. And so moving to put a people positive transition much more at the heart um, of the focus is something we're really looking at and building into the work that we're doing. Um, and I think we're going to become increasingly important and we really need to push towards a kind of net zero for all uh, approach to the work that we're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. Really interesting insights as well, because as we were discussing, the private sector is also a social uh, actor. So even if sometimes we feel like the businesses talk a different language, they are part of, of the pathway that we need to follow for Paris Agreement goals. And some of these topics that you touch are very important. We were discussing with um, some of the members from your team earlier that he was saying, actually, I remember, that there is no excuse for businesses not to take action to integrate just transitions in value chains at the moment. And while it sounds like a very big challenge, there are very uh, tangible and immediate steps that we can start taking. And some of the examples that you uh, present us today can be like a first step in that direction. So thank you very much for, for the intervention. And I'll move on now then to Jacob. So Jacob, uh, as I was saying, he's from DigiClima. And given the increased interest of countries in discussing these equity risks of unilateral measures impacting trade flows within the UNFCCC, can you tell us what international spaces and platforms do you think should be used for, to discuss this topic? And how can we adjust really and connect the two conversations that are taking place currently in separate or fragmented forums? And by fragmented, I mean in UNFCCC, WTO, but even within the UNFCCC itself. Uh, can you enlighten us? Thank, thanks very much, first of all, for inviting me to, to share a perspective from, uh, from the EU on these issues. 
incredibly important topic, uh, this uh, very uh, important global commitment that we've undertaken and reinforced in Dubai that, that what we need to do is transition uh, to net zero and to make sure as we do transition to net zero, we're doing it in a, a both fair and effective manner. In other words, the just transition. Um, we in the EU have been, have been working towards this for, for many decades. Uh, we, we have a binding law that requires that the EU be at net zero by 2050. And each time we put in place a new set of policies that ensure that we're on that pathway, we have to make sure that as we transition, uh, that we aren't having uh, in, uh, unintended consequences on Hi. the emissions of others, the, the, the uh, production processes of others across these supply chains that were described before. Um, one of the ways that we have had to do that is when we, for example, have put in place uh, the, the highest uh, binding carbon price uh, on the planet, it's probably between 70 and 80 euros today, we have to take into account that that, that high cost of carbon within the EU that applies to energy intensive sectors doesn't inadvertently cause the increase of emissions from those sa same sectors within our trading partners. We want to go net zero, we want to keep our market open, but we don't want our carbon price to produce what's called carbon leakage. Similarly, when we require within the EU that, that our member states uh, achieve renewable energy policies and re renewable energy outcomes, and we include within that fuel mix biofuels, we want to make sure that that increased demand for biofuels doesn't lead to the production of unsustainable forest products in our training partners. Um, so in an integrated world that is committed to a just transition, where economies and jurisdictions move to higher, higher climate ambition, there are inevitably spillover effects um, of, of the kind that, that we are now trying through our policies to address uh, as well. And we are trying to address these very carefully uh, very thoughtfully in a way that, that uh, understands the impacts on, on third parties. Um, we also, as a first mover, realize that our policies under, are under more scrutiny than other policies, but it, it has to be observed uh, that as more and more countries take their Paris commitments seriously, we are seeing similar policies emerge elsewhere. We know that there are other jurisdictions, for example, that are considering putting in place carbon border adjustment measures. We know that there are other uh, that um, uh, are, are exploring the way in which they can make sure that as they invest more, for example, in, in, um, uh, in, in batteries, that they are conscious of the impacts of the, the supply chains that they'll be creating for critical raw materials. So it's, it's not a, an EU experience alone, it's, it's one that, that's spreading elsewhere. And this clearly means that we have to enhance the opportunities for international cooperation on these issues uh, to prevent uh, uh, un unnecessary frictions or unintended consequences. As a result of that, we, we talk about these policies with our partners all the time, uh, from the early design phase, now as we're beginning to implement them in the implementation phase as well. We do that through bilateral outreach, and we do it very, very intensively in the international organization that most of us also belong to outside uh, of Bonn and in Geneva, the World Trade Organization, which has the responsibility in particular to make sure that as countries put in place policies to achieve environmental objectives, they're doing it in accordance with agreed disciplines, that they are fair, they're science-based, uh, and they are, are not arbitrary or unjustifiable. In this context uh, of, of the climate change negotiations here, um, there have been many calls that we increase the opportunities to have conversations about these policies as well. And the EU is open to that and has been open to that. And we've been working on that in the context of something called the Response Measures Forum which if you guys follow that, uh, you'll know has a mandate to talk about a number of things, uh, just transition, uh, economic diversification, and something called the cross-border effects uh, of, of climate policies or of response measures as we call them in these negotiations. We're happy to have those conversations there um, as long as they aren't about the EU's policies alone. Because as I said, uh, economies everywhere are taking choices about how they, they scale up their ambition, how they scale up their ability to produce the new products of the green, green transition, such as electronic vehicles, such as solar energy uh, technologies, such as wind energy technologies. And as they do so, they are also having spillover effects on their trading partners, both positive uh, and negative. So in a multilateral context like this, one of the terms in which we want to engage in these issues is, is not just about one party's policies, but about all parties' policies, whether they happen to be developing or, or, or developed. Uh, and the spillover effects uh, of, of those policies. 
Finally, um, in, in terms of the choice of forum, you know, where do we talk about this? Uh, we, we favor the response measure space in part because the, the Just Transition Work Program is supposed to be much more than about trade spillover effects. Uh, it, it is supposed to be about the just transition of the workplace. Uh, it's about the challenge of economic diversification as well. Uh, and if, if the conversation became exclusively about what's called in, in this context unilateral measures, we would have uh, very, very little time to, to talk about anything else. And then finally, the, the way in which the issue is often raised in, in the negotiations here seems to be out of a desire to talk about and even potentially to resolve disputes or concerns about individual parties, individual policies. And we don't have the machinery to do that in this process. Um, we, we don't have anything like a dispute settlement mechanism of the kind that's offered by the WTO, which has a, a clear and predictable process for resolving disputes. And uh, you know this process is contentious enough uh, without turning it into a, a circumstance in which um, every time we got together, we would be able to, to pick up different countries' elements of their climate policies that we had uh, more or less uh, a degree of, of comfort with. Um, so really appreciate having this side event alongside the negotiations to give an opportunity for uh, us to have this discussion outside of the, the formal negotiating rooms where things can lead to, uh, to more finger pointing necessarily than the, the, the positive incentives and constructive conversations, for example, that uh, Mayara was talking are more, in, more needed in this, in this process. Uh, and look, looking forward to uh, to the exchange. Thanks. Um, let me start by saying that uh, thank you, May Mayara, for raising the um, paper that we did a few in 2021 on the impact of CBAM on developing countries, um, which was one of the first measures that uh, our colleague from the EU has mentioned. Um, and we've done an updated of that paper based on the 88 um, the uh, EU or euro uh, per ton that is going to come up pretty shortly. But let me start by saying, uh, agreeing with the with the speaker from the World Business Council on Sustainable Development that it's extremely important, uh, not just for business, but also for government to look and, and stack the social and the environmental. We will not get there without stacking both the social and the environmental or the end of development. So there is spillover effect um, that are positive. So as was mentioned by the EU colleagues, um, there are now UK, Canada, and others that are considering putting in place ambitious policies, which we need because the current NDCs are not um, aligned with a 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. So we need more ambitious policies and uh, to to achieve our goal, Paris agreement however um you know the the design of those policies can have um positive or negative impact on 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 other governments Ms. Panda mentioned that what we need for cooperation is more understanding of specifically what those negative and positive spillovers uh, effects are so for instance subsidies um could be positive if they have they are um, can benefit the rest of the world by reducing the cost of, ac of access to te these technologies that are needed for the transition, the just transition. But they can also have a neg negative impact if, um, if developing countries that don't have the fiscal space um, to put them in place um, cannot compete then with the, these policies. And so what we believe needs to be happening, and this is what I think Ms. Penda was mentioning, is we need to better understand, we need to document specifically, provide evidence of what those negative and positive, and especially in this case, the negative spillovers are, so that they can be uh, supporting the dialogue that are needed, either in the cross-border effect um, uh, forum or, or the forum where, where some of these discussions are at. And at UNCTAD, our member states are raising these issues increasingly as the um, as the concept note for this um, session shows that trade and climate policies are interacting. So basically what we find is a few things now, and we're developing actually a paper with uh, the World Bank, the IMF, the WTO, and the OECD on exactly how can we reduce these impact of fragmentation of these policies. Because we at the Paris Agreement allow for fragmentation of policies and sequencing. And there it's it's what we find is there's not one policy. Yes, carbon pricing, if you have one externality, which is greenhouse house gases, is the best practice, the best policies. But if you have several other um 
externality that is near trying to achieve adaptation and achieve the SDGs at the same time, it doesn't mean that it will be the most effective policies. So how do we ensure that we have cooperative uh, policies that reduce the cost of compliance, the cost of meeting the requirements um, to equival equivalencies and others? How do we ensure they are effective, i.e. they increase the ambition of everyone, that they are leave no one behind, which is the uh, principle for the SDGs, and they are equitable because within the Paris Agreement, they, we need to agree, we need to abide by the common but differentiated responsibility and capacity uh, principle. And so what we are doing is updating that paper of the CBAM to see what the impacts are. So we can then have discussion at the specific level of which countries are affected. And we also developing a carbon climate um, uh, framework where we actually can measure at its several model that we put together to actually measure the social economic impact of the just transition at the country level. Then we can see if the price of energy is going up tremendously, you, you know that they can, you can, you're at risk of having a, a social outrage. And then you can fall, have a fall of government, and then you can't put in place the policies that are needed to achieve the Paris Agreement. So we all have a duty to look at those impacts. And what our role is as international organization, and especially as UNCTAD, is to look especially at the development impact of those. Um, and then, for instance, is, um, what we find, and we want to go deeper into as to where and in, in, in how, um, is, is, for instance, is the impact on carbon intensive sectors that did, if they don't have access to affordable technology to diversify their economy uh, and lose market share. How do we uh, harmonize and reduce um, the cost of, of compliance? How do we um, ensure that developing countries can actually take have the productive capacity to take advantage of the new business opportunities within the transition, such as critical mineral, renewable energy, uh, green again, grids, uh, and other national green export uh, strategies on agriculture, on tourism, on, on the blue economy. So these are all areas where we see a, a, a need for cooperation. We also, so these this, these policies need to be minimizing the, the negative impact on developing countries and maximize the positive spillover. Mm -hmm. um, and this is this is what we're focusing on. But we also need to focus, if we're gonna focus on the social upskilling and reskilling, as our colleague at ILO keeps saying, mm -hmm. but also of civil servant, because these policies, they're gonna have to be sequenced. And because there's not just one externalities, they will have to be complemented by other policies to ensure there's a redistribution effect and all the cost doesn't go on this on the most vulnerable people and the most vulnerable countries. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chantelaine. I'm really glad that we made the IT work because it was a very interesting intervention. And after being here for seven days, I'm pretty sure it's not your internet. <laughs> um, Yes, yeah, so the last intervention from this panel is from Mrs. Uh, Ms. Renzi. I know you already touched on this a little bit in your opening speech, but can you please expand a little bit on the importance of international cooperation for PNG? And in particular, if you see a potential for the JTWP, for example, to support achieving the goals of bringing together climate-centric uh, trade systems and just transitions. Thank you very much. And um, let me start by thanking uh, Chantaline and Jacob. I think a common point that they both uh, raised in their intervention was the, the need by countries when it comes to discussing these issues, the need for understanding. Because when, when governments, presidents, and prime ministers adopted the Paris Agreement, um, from the outset, we all had um, we came with advisors, technical experts on the ground in Paris, and we had foresight and we were very well aware of what we're going to, well, what we would be agreeing to and how that would impact on our uh, economics in the next 10 to 20 years. For PNG, we have the same um, carbon neutrality target um, as the European Union and uh, that target was um, was established with the understanding of how we move forward with the implementation 
of the Paris Agreement. And when we look at international cooperation, I think the first mistake uh, we would rather say within this process is the inconsistency when we make mention of uh, um, this issue as being very specific to trade implication. Uh, rather, it should be an impact of response measures because the approach taken by the EU to the EU Green Deal and also the United States under their Inflation Reduction Act would be also similar to a number of countries around the world trying to transition from a brown economy to a green economy. They have the legal mandate under the Paris Agreement to set targets, including how to achieve those targets, and it may encroach into uh, trade arrangements. So these are things that are decided at the national level. When it comes to international cooperation, it, it requires more dialogue, more understanding, and more appreciation, and how we can course correct ourselves within the discussions, especially under the UNFCCC. And I agree with Jacob, because if, if you look at Article 4 of the Climate Change Convention and how it established the role of the forum and its KCI to serve the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement, the most important role of the Forum on Response Measures is to undertake this kind of assessments. Uh, with the current ongoing discussion on the Just Transition Work Program, the challenge we have amongst everyone within the room is the multiple interpretation of what the Just Transition Work Program should be and what it should deliver on. But when you take a step back and you look at the work under the Forum on Response Measures, it's a good basis and a starting point to assist countries have dialogue amongst each other and understand each other, whether is this a trade issue or is this an issue that comes about as a result of a response measure that is being undertaken in the EU, in the United States, even in developed countries around the world, because we've agreed to specific provisions in the Paris Agreement for developed country parties to take the lead. And some of them, in the effort of taking the lead, their activities to reduce emissions, practically reduce emissions, will actually lead into affecting the trade arrangements they have with their global partners. So as PNG, we believe that First of all, we need to address the, the confusion that we have amongst ourselves. And, and I do agree with Jacob. Every time when the discussion on just transition comes up, the only example we have in the, the, the room is the EU Green Deal. The EU Green Deal. Nobody wants to speak about what the efforts of the other developed country parties, including maybe some developing country parties like PNG are doing in an attempt to move forward with the implementation of our NDC targets in order to achieve um, net zero or carbon neutrality by 2050. For example, the decision may be in the future to impose maybe tax on used vehicles sent to us by Japan, uh, that would be a unilateral decision. And for us, it would not be seen as a trade measure if we capture that as part of our revised NDC activities in an effort to raise ambition in order to achieve tripling renewable energy target. Until and unless we parties under this forum for a start, we differentiate between what is a trade measure and what is a responsible response measures undertaken by parties to progress their ambition and the implementation of those ambitions then international cooperation with other bodies, including the WTO, the UNFCCC, and other processes will become extremely easy. Thank you. Hey, Renzi, thank you much, very much for this intervention. And it's really interesting to see some um, commonalities and also agreements already uh, coming up in the panel. I think this is a great segue, actually, to open the floor for Q&A. We have approximately 10 minutes. Thanks, thanks very much, um, Richard Klein of the Stockholm Environment Institute. Um, first of all, thanks to all the speakers and the panelists for a really interesting uh, session. Um, 
the um the, the, the event is, is you know, the title is about adaptation, mitigation, and trade. And we've heard a lot about mitigation and its specifics um, and, you know, which is the best forum. So I hear much that in a way also has an adaptation analog. You know, for example, what, what Jake is saying, you know, the spillover effects uh, of, of, of measures. One could argue that adaptation uh, through trade can work in a very similar way. It's called maladaptation, as, as Mikhail said. Um, that, for example, through you know, changing the sourcing of, of companies, say, in Europe, um, what it, it could affect the you know, subsistence farmers in Brazil, for example, speaking about coffee. Um, I guess a specific question to, to Jake is, you know, I know that the, uh, the submission of the uh, of, of European Commission on, um, on the Just Transition Work Program uh, doesn't actually talk about adaptation or just resilience at all, even though the adaptation strategy of, of the EU introduces the term just resilience. I was just wondering what your take is on sort of the adaptation perspective of just transition and whether you also see uh, either the JTWP or, or another forum as um, addressing that. The, you know, the decision on the JTWP refers to the three goals of the Paris Agreement, so that would include a global goal on adaptation. So I was wondering whether you know, you've got uh, any insights into the European perspective there. Thanks. Uh, so this is Kimmy Cushman, Scientific Advisor at Plant-Based Treaty. So my question is for Jacob, but I'd be happy for the other panelists to comment on as well. Um, I'd like you to comment on the responsibility of the, United, or the EU to, uh, for diet change toward plant-based diets um, with respect to the net zero goals, as well as uh, carbon leakage, as you talked about, um, given the fact that the EU relies on uh, feed, animal feed for the animals that are grown to be eaten and used for animal-based foods um, in the EU, uh, as well as the animals that are exported from around the world uh, that are grown uh, in countries that are exploiting the resources in those countries and the land, um, and what the EU's responsibility is to change those demands. Uh, thank you to the panelists. Um, Stephen Bryan from Australia. Um, so in discussions around green trade, we often highlight the challenges and the risks, and of course these exist, uh, but we don't, don't often talk about some of the benefits. So um, research coming out of my country, out of the Australian National University on International Green Economy Collaborations, illustrates the potential for these collaborations to foster both environmental and industrial gains uh, through things like technology incubation, R&D coordination, harmonise taxonomies, reduce barriers to trade, decarbonise value chains, across both the global north and the global south. So would anyone on the panel be able to comment on the idea that these international green collaborations can lead to benefits, including for just transition pathways? Thank you very much. So who would like to start, maybe Jacob? Sure, um, ha happy to, and I'll, I'll be very, very brief and therefore not provide <laughs> probably some uh, unsatisfactory responses in terms of completeness. In terms of the scope of the Just Transition Work Program, I think, in its earlier stages, we're really trying to honor its origins in these negotiations. And it really was the, the labor groups uh, and the ILO that, that brought the concept of just transition and in particular the just transition of the workforce into our conversation. And they were, they were concerned in particularly about mitigation policies that had the potential to displace workers that had previously been relying on either fossil fuel production or, or fossil fuel related industries like the automobile sector. So we think that's the appropriate way to start the JTWP, but, but the idea of transition and the idea of justice should cross cut everything that we're doing uh, in, in the EFCCC and it certainly should be built into the work that we're doing on adaptation as well. And, and we certainly hope to see in the indicators that are being designed under the, the GGA um, uh, program at the moment to take into account these concepts uh, as well. It's not a direct translation because the transition uh, to 1.5 is a positive one, uh, to avoiding 1.5 is a positive one, while the transition that we have to go through to deal with the impacts of, of 1.5 is a, is a much more negative one. In both contexts, I think we have to take into account that whether we're generating benefits of just transition or we're dealing with the unintended negative consequences that we have to make sure that the, the poorest and the most uh, vulnerable are, are prioritized in that, in that effort because they have the least capacity to deal with either of those aspects. In, in terms of, of the EU's vision for moving towards a plant-based uh, economy, um, very, very tricky from a political point of view, as I know by working on these issues, you must be very well, well aware of. 
as we're moving through our different sectors, I suppose you could say that we've tackled the, the low hanging fruit the first, right? So the energy intensive industrial power uh, producing sectors that are under the cap of the ETS, the easiest to put in place a carbon price, a cap and, and a pretty direct result. But as we move down the, uh, the curve towards net zero, it's going to be increasingly apparent that things like the agricultural sector and the land use sector more generally are where the, the, the highest growing fruit is uh, to mix agricultural metaphors um, and where lifestyle change and consumer behavior is going to have to increasingly contribute to our being net zero. Um, we don't know yet what tools we as regulators can use most effectively to help encourage and incentivize that behavioral change. But we know that it is politically very, very challenging and very difficult. So I think it has to start with information at, at, in the first circumstance uh, to encourage those choices that consumers have to make themselves. But, but we'll see in the coming decades of, of how well that, that will work. Thank you. And I know Jenny wants also to intervene now. So I think I was just going to respond to the, the final question. Um, I used to head up Mission Innovation, which is the global forum on, on clean energy technology innovation cooperation. And for me, that type of forum like really showed the benefit of international cooperation mechanisms to drive global progress. So we used to work, I mean, it's 25 countries, but it included India, Brazil, South Africa, Australia, many others. And I think, for instance, one of the benefits of that is where we saw hydrogen coming up the agenda, the value of that very rapid knowledge sharing and insights that different countries are able to gain from each other and also aligning R&D mechanisms, international research collaboration, um, and also you know, some of the insights on how to scale these technologies and the types of policy incentives. So you have seen the, Euro the European Union, Australia, India, many other, Chile, many others, putting in the incentives and policies that are needed to, to scale those technologies. So I think those type of other forums that sit out outside the UNFCCC, things like the Breakthrough Agenda are extremely valuable that enable the first movers and countries to move faster and enable shared cooperation, um, which is really, really um, valuable. I think just one, a couple of things very quickly to highlight is that we've talked a lot about some of the policies um, such as CBAM and, uh, and others that are out there. I think another thing that is really needed to enable everybody to benefit from uh, new technologies and innovations and trade is standards and certification and harmonization of those. And we really need more efforts um, between countries to enable that because that's how, for instance, as cost comes down of different technologies, other countries are able to access those, but also get benefits of those uh, scaled up markets. So I think, you know, on hydrogen, steel and others really need more work on that to harmonize certification standards. And there's a really fragmented regulatory system out there, which is which will hurt the, the scale up of the, the trade. And I think um, there is a lot of work going on around alternative proteins. And I think actually we're beginning to see various different countries move and a lot of different uh, groups coming to the table to begin to work on that. So I think that's going to be an interesting area to look at over the next uh, couple of years to see how that scales and some of the international collaboration that comes through around that. Thank you very much, Jenny, and also for the questions from the audience. I think we, since we are reaching the end of the event, I would like to do a final round uh, with all the panelists. If you can please say in one line, in just one line because of time, <laughs> uh, what is the key takeaway from each one of you? And maybe starting with Mayara and making the way uh, to the left. No, we'll be very brief. Basically, I think the lesson hearing from all of the panelists is the need for greater international cooperation, that there are negative impacts of this transition, but there are some positive opportunities as well. So the need for well-documented evidence to, to identify those opportunities and make sure we are addressing those negative spillover effects. And of course, that requires a strong international collaboration. So it's great that we're having this uh, conversation today. Uh, yeah, uh, I would say probably two things. Um, the importance of addressing mitigation and adaptation uh, in, in context of trade and supply chains uh, together in an integrated manner is incredibly important because the, the risk of neglecting one can actually just uh, annul any, any benefits and progress you do on the other side of things. Um, and also just that addressing it through just transition is not only could because it's the right thing to do, but there's actually a strong business case in it. There are both benefits to the workers, the communities that underpin the trade and supply chains, as well as the businesses themselves. 
<laughs> I've spoken a lot, so I'll be very brief. Um, uh, I think the key uh, need for a combination of evidence and, and evidence-based analysis of the kind that, that Angtab was referring to, um, and, and empathy, uh, the, the, the need to, to understand the different positions from which we're coming uh, in, in this joint effort to get to net zero. So I think for me, it would be that we have to put people positive transition at the heart of the work we're doing. We've really got to um, shift. And I think also that we need this um, cooperation between business, government and the finance sectors and come together much more as this is a mission together um, and problem solving together if we're going to tackle the challenges, both the just transition, but also some of these trade challenges that we've been talking about as well. For me, I'll be very brief. It's I agree with everyone. It's about uh, recognizing both the positive impacts and the negative impacts of um, the outcome of our discussion here. And secondly, to have more of such dialogues so that uh, we can allow you know other participants who normally attend this session to come and join in and also have a more diverse understanding of what we are trying to do and consider holding such dialogues at every um, session of every SP. Thank you. Santaline. Thank you so much. So one is um, uh, based, we've reviewed NDCs from 60 developing countries. So on the positive side, there's a lot that trade and investment policies could be helping developing countries as means of implementation that are underutilized in the existing NDCs. So under the UN leadership of supporting the next round of NDCs, UNCTAD is developing the guidelines on trade and investment related measures to maximize the impact that they can have. Now, on adaptation, on mitigation, social, uh, social economic, and environmental impact. So we're, we're we're looking at all of those. So I agree with everything you said. The second part is there will be spillover effect, and one of them, for instance, is many many of the trade measures that are being put in place right now are limiting the diffusion of technology that is needed. So it, then it it reduces our ability to achieve the Paris Agreement. So how do we to by working together, having the evidence, work together to ensure that the right technology is in the right place to ensure. And then Ongtad is happy to have a a space to offer a space to discuss that. But also, I believe our colleague from the Azerbaijan presidency are in the room and under their leadership, we're developing a work program uh, called Bitfit on the that that they will announce shortly. Thank you, Chantaline. I'm afraid that's all we all the time that we have today. So I need to finish now with the event. But I want to thank all the panelists for the great insights. I think so far entrenchment has been the flavor of the day here at Bonn. So it's really great to see this space is coming up with WCA yeah, agreements and really uh, intentions to keep the conversation going. As we were saying earlier, many participants uh, mentioned on a race to the top rather than a race to the bottom style of conversation. And I, I thank all the panelists again for joining us. I also want to thank again the independent state of Papua New Guinea, SCI and Platform Asipo for co-hosting the event today. Uh, and I just wish you a very fruitful rest of the SB60. Thank you all. Thank you.